So this is actually my third .NET Fringe. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but this is probably my favorite .NET Fringe so far. Do you agree with me? Yeah. So the only problem is this time, uh, Glenn made me actually earn my beer by forcing me to give a talk. The last two years, I could just hang out here, enjoy my beer, sit downstairs with you guys. And this time, I actually have to do a talk. But I only have 30 minutes, which means the only thing I can cover is .NET Standard. If I had 60 minutes, I would talk about .NET Deluxe, but sorry, like we have to just cover the standard. So how many of you have heard of the standard and have a vague idea what it is? Awesome. Then I can go and you can have, no. All right. So let me give you a little history. So when we started .NET Framework like 15 years ago, we shipped one framework called the .NET Framework. And the world was good because you could write wind forms, you could write web forms, you could write Windows services, you could write console apps, and there was only one framework. And over the years, there was more and more frameworks that came to be. I mean, there was Mono, which later on turned into Xamarin, uh, which you can now run on iOS and Android and macOS. And then a few years ago, we shipped .NET Core, which extended our reach to you know, UWP and then also server workloads on Azure and Linux and whatever things you want to have. So what's great about this picture? What's great about this picture is that you can pretty much do whatever you want with .NET. If you want to write desktop apps on Windows or Mac OS, if you want to write mobile apps on iOS and Android, if you want to do it in F Sharp, that's also fine. Um, I would prefer C Sharp, but it's up to you guys. Uh, but the point is you can go anywhere you want. Right? .NET is technology that gets you literally in every app store in the universe. What is not great about this picture is the bottom part. Ah, here we go. I'm too far. Uh, so the bottom part is basically we have what we call the base class libraries, which is basically the set of APIs you use to read a text file, you know, talk to a cloud service, do reflection, collections, that sort of thing. And we also have four versions of those. And I say four because realistically, there's three platforms depicted here. But if you want to share your code across multiple different you know, experiences or platforms, as we call them, then you have to think about the intersection, like the set of APIs you can actually use. So the problem is, that it's difficult to reuse code. You have to basically have a Venn diagram in your head where you have to think about the APIs you can actually share. Um, the other problem is that we have is .NET Core is relatively small, and we'll talk about this a bit later on as well. So that what you can actually share is not as big as you would like it to be. And then on top of that, it also makes us really hard for us to innovate because we have to like, move stuff around across four or five platforms, and that's not really great. So a childhood hero of me, Captain Picard from Star Trek looked at the situation and he said, there are four BCLs. <laughs> but as we all know from the movie Highlander, um, there can only be one, right? <laughs> so what we did is we said, well, why do we have four base class libraries? That's stupid. Let's just have one. And we call essentially that set of the, the, you know, the fundamental pieces that you would just assume to be everywhere, formalize this, and that's what we call the .NET standard. So the one thing is it's basically one BCL, not multiple. So you no longer have a Venn diagram in your head. Uh, the set of APIs you can share is actually much bigger. And the really nice thing is if you write a library that targets this thing, you can literally run anywhere. So what is it? So at its very core, .NET Standard is a specification, meaning it's a set of APIs that we want every platform to have. And I really want to emphasize this. It's not just, you know, by happenstance, what you can share today. It's an actual thing where we say, no, this is the spec, and all future platforms also have to implement that spec. So it's no longer this guessing game what the next platform will support. It's actually, it will be everything that's in there. The second part of it is there's a tooling component for you, uh, involved as well. I mean, unlike you're a TED and you like to download uh, the ECMA specification and print it out on 500 pages and read it in a stormy night, you probably want to get stuff done. So what we have done is we have taken the specification and made it toolable. So you can actually do file new .NET standard project, in which case you're constrained by the APIs that are in the standard. So one analogy that I've found works pretty well with people is if you think of the standard as the HTML spec, then by extension you can think of the platforms, you know, .NET Framework, .NET Core, and Xamarin, essentially just as the browsers implementing that spec. So you never run on the standard, you're writing for the standard, and you run on the actual platforms. So how many of you follow what we announced at Build? Few of you, OK. So .NET Standard is not a new thing. It basically shipped a few years ago when we shipped .NET Core as well. But there were two major complaints we have heard. One of them is it was way too small. 
Because at Microsoft, we thought it was a good idea to take .NET Core, look at all our APIs, and remove half of them and ship it. And turns out people don't like that. So what we did in 2.0, we added a ton of APIs back, uh, 20,000 APIs, in fact. Uh, by extension, adding it to the spec is easy, but the work on our side was to actually add the APIs to .NET Core. Every other platform already had them, so that was uh, the work that Carol and other people on my team had to do. And then the second thing is, as I said, .NET Framework is pretty old, right? It's 15 years out the door, uh, people using it for a couple of years now. And it is the thing that has the most mind share. So if you go on NuGet.org today, you will find that the majority of libraries that are out there still target the .NET Framework, because you can pretty much use that thing across the board. Um, with portable class libraries and .NET Standard, we made it so that you can only reference things that are targeting the standard, and that's really inconvenient, because that means you can only target the standard when the thing you're using also targets the standard. So we added what we call the Compatium. It's a fantastic thing I can't really talk about in 30 minutes, but there's a video on that online. Basically, the short answer is 70% of NuGet packages out there only use APIs we have in the standard, and we made it so that you can reference them as if they were targeting the standard, which means it's much easier for you to move to the standard without waiting for the universe to catch up. And since talking is not exciting enough, let me do a demo. So what I have here is Northwind. How many of you remember Northwind? That means I'm surrounded by old people like me, and that's good. So Northwind is our database that we have done, and so I've written this. Great. Aha. So you can see that basically what this is, it's, uh, you can see I'm a designer because when you resize this form, the button stays. Um, <laughs> but if I click load, what you can see is there are three names popping up. So what I did is I basically wrote a little tool that essentially just scans for Northwind employees who are retired at this point because um, the database is so old. So what you see here is uh, literally the old technology we shipped in 1.0. It's uh, the Northwind data set. And I actually have it on disk. It's a giant XML file. And what I've done here is I just you know, scanned for who is retired. And that's the German age here. If you want the, you know, the US age, it would be like 120, probably. <laughs> um, but that's besides the point. So how would we modernize this thing? So how many of you hate data set? Let's start with that. Yeah, I hate it too. The problem is what I hate even more is if I have to touch existing code that uses data set to not use it. Um, so that's why we added data set to .NET Standard. But let's first modernize the app. So the first thing I want to do here is Use var everywhere. Doesn't work, apparently. Huh. There's a bug. Inconceivable. <laughs> so I guess we can't modernize the app. Too bad. Anyway, so what I would do is, <laughs> it's like a real world project, right? So what I would do is I would create a .NET standard project here, a class library. I would take my amazing data access logic, move that here. VS has to really think hard to move a single file between two directories, and now it's really hard. Amazing, it did it. Now I actually add a reference to my class library. And when I run Northwind now, something really amazing happens. We're all watching your progress bar right now. Oh, yeah, it helps if I close it before. Click the button, and it does exactly the same thing as before. But now it's actually properly architected because I have my data access logic in a separate DLL. But that's not really the new thing. We've done this for years. What's really cool now is I can add a new project here. Let's say I target ASP.NET Core. Make sure you select 2.0 here, because 2.0 is awesome. I'm not a hipster, so I don't enable the Docker support. But what I can now do is I can just add a reference here to, my, to the same class library, go to my startup, and then change the response here. And let's say Northwind DB get data. Use some Roslyn foo to get the namespace fixed. And it really helps if I select this as a startup project.
And so what's cool now is, this is the same tag that you could have written 10 years ago, but it now runs on .NET Core. So you could take this thing, put it in a container, and run it on Linux if you want. So you can modernize your app with this mechanism fairly easy. Now, when I say you can run it on Linux, obviously, depending on how you write your code, that may work well or less well. I mean, this works fantastic on Windows, especially when the file is actually in that location. Um, so you probably want to replace it with a real database, but you get the point. Like, you can modernize your app and reuse stuff across a bunch of different um, platforms. So a question I often get asked is, how does .NET Standard differ from portable class libraries? I mean, how many of you know what portable class libraries are? Pretty much everybody. Yeah, so last year, David Keane was here, uh, who is now lame and lives in Australia and didn't come. But the point is, like, he worked in portable class libraries for a few years, so did I. So we really attached to this technology. But the, the real difference between .NET Standard and, .NET, uh, and portable class libraries was that portable was something that my team did, meaning there were all the .NET platforms, and nobody really cared about whether you can reuse code across different .NET platforms. That's what we cared about, but nobody else did. So the best thing we could do is, after the platform ship, find the APIs that are the same, and then give you tooling to actually target that. And contrary to popular belief, PCLs weren't actually the lowest common denominator. You selected the platforms you want to run on, and then we basically computed which APIs are available in that intersection. And these are the things that we call profiles. And you can see it here, we have a Venn diagram with three. If you now have six, your head starts to melt. And if you add versions, you really question your life choices and want to do JavaScript probably. <laughs> I'm joking, nobody wants to do JavaScript. But the, <laughs> the point is that you know, you're not very happy. The other problem is that it's very hard for you to reason about what happens if we ship another platform. If you target that, what happens? Do you get now half the APIs or a third? Or, you know, it's not really easy to reason about that. So long story short, we decided that PCLs are deprecated now. So in the next update of VS, uh, when you look at the templates, it will actually say legacy. You know, as Oren said, these are not the libraries you're looking for. Uh, look at .NET Standard instead. So why is that a better solution? So first of all, it's not really a Venn diagram. Uh, it's just a bunch of concentric circles if you think of the version numbers. Because .NET Standard versions just at any other .NET platform, meaning, of course, there are versions of it. But higher versions have just more APIs than the previous version. It right? makes sense. The only thing that's different is that particular .NET platforms decide to implement particular versions of the standard. And so at Microsoft, we have two hobbies. One of them is writing code. The other one is finding creative ways to attach version numbers to things. <laughs> so let me actually show you. So when you want to find out uh, what's happening with .NET Standard, what you can do is you can just say .NET Standard. Then you find our docs. And then you find this table here. And this table is amazing. If I would have gotten this, a penny every single time I had to explain this table, I would not be here with you suckers. I would just be somewhere on an island enjoying my pina colada. But it's actually fairly hard to explain this table. So what I've tried to do instead, I wrote this thing. Uh, you know, said nobody wants to write JavaScript, but turns out it's useful at times. So this is basically an interactive version of that table. And let me spend a few minutes explaining this, because I think this is the most complicated thing that you know, is available for the standards. So that's the thing you need to understand. So at the very top, what you see in the blue bar is the, is the number of available APIs you have. So it gives you a visual indicator of how much stuff you get. So if, I, if I'm targeting higher versions of the standard, you can see that the bar is growing. And you see that every, every once in a while, there's a spike. And we do 2.0, and we really jump over because we added so many APIs. So that's the first thing. The second thing you see in this table is what .NET platform implements which version of the standard. And that's really where people get confused. So let me pick a few examples. When you look at .NET Core, you see this very long green bar. So what you see here is that .NET Core, if you target .NET Standard 1.0, you can run on .NET Core 1.0. And that is because .NET Core 1.0 implements 1.6 of the standard, which now means, of course, 1.0 works, but so would 1.1 all the way up to 1.6. You can also see this .NET Framework 4.5 only implements 1.1 of the standard. So that means this is what you know, I would be able to run on those two platforms. Now, when you look at Windows Phone Silverlight, which hopefully nobody cares about anymore, it only implements 1.0 of the standard. So if you don't care about it, you can just target 1.1, and 
And now you see there's a red bar because their platform is now unavailable to you. And so as I'm going towards the right, you lose essentially particular versions of platforms and sometimes entire platforms because they never implemented a higher version of the standard. And then if you're targeting 2.0, you have to be basically on latest everything we have. Does that table make sense? Like my, my goal for this talk is if you leave with nothing, then hopefully you, you at least keep this table in your head because that is probably the most useful thing you can take away from this talk. All right, so then the next question is usually, okay, what does it mean for me? What should I do? And the answer is, you have to consider this trade-off. The lower the version of the standard is, the fewer APIs you have. But it also means you have, the more, you have more reach. So it's a trade-off between reach and functionality. If you want latest everything, well, then you run on fewer places. So generally speaking, what you should do is you should just target the lowest version you can get away with. And the easiest way to do that is, to create a project in Visual Studio, target the standard, and then go to properties and go down to lower versions until your project stops compiling. And then you just lose, then you just target the latest version. It takes about three minutes to do, and it's usually the easiest way to do that. So what then happens usually as well is when people learn about the standard, they wonder what does it mean for cases where I can't use the standard? So meaning, let's say you want to call APIs that are not part of the standard. As I said, there's multiple different .NET platforms, and each of them bring their own API surface. Each of them have their own unique capabilities, right? That's a good thing. But what happens if you want to call those? Are you screwed, or that, is there a story for you? Or as uh, Private Hudson from Alien would phrase it, game over, man, game over. So what we have here is actually a useful thing. So I have here a little demo. And again, let me just make sure I can deploy this guy. I'm actually... So these amazing two apps. Uh, all these apps are doing is basically they show you which longitude latitude you are at. So they call the operating system geolocation APIs to figure out where you are. And they both share the same information, which is not super surprising. But when we actually look at the code here, so let's start with the .NET Framework WinForms app. This is what you would write in WinForms to access the device. So what you have here is uh, the Geo Coordinate Watcher API from System Device Location. And there's no async version of that, so I just use task.run to wrap this whole thing so I don't block the UI thread. Then I have to do a little dance because it will not return the information immediately, uh, so I wait until that does, do some waiting, and eventually what I do is I just give you back a tuple that has longitude latitude, right? Not super complicated. In the UWP app, it's conceptually the same thing. All I do is I give you back essentially latitude and longitude as a tuple, but the APIs are different. So in this case, I use WinRT APIs, which are in Windows devices geolocation, and there already are modern APIs, so they're synchronized already, so all I have to do is you know, call the API, await it, don't have to do the dance for waiting for the device to give me useful information, and then I'm done. So that's sweet. So how would you wrap that in a single library? Because if you look at my solution right now, you will see that there is four projects. So I have one WinForms app, I have one UWP app, and then I have one library for the .NET Framework app, and I have one library for the UWP app. So this way I can at least use the same library across all my apps, but I cannot use it across platforms. So let me do some magic here, because I'm a PM, I don't write code. All I do is I just switch branches. And then magic happens, and I now when you look closely here, I only have a single project. I have a GPS project now. No more GPS Net45 or GPS UWP, it's just one project. So what does it look like? Actually, scroll out a bit. So what you, what you see now here is I have one method, and the API share was the same before already, so I kind of made this more explicit now. But basically, I have um, one page of code, and all I have to do is basically have write a bunch of if devs. So I say, if I'm running on .NET Framework, do this. If I'm running on UWP, do that. The magic really here is it's a single project, but there's this drop-down picker here. 
So if you ever used linked files, then you know that what we show you there is the projects the file is linked into. Now, this is a single project, but what we show you here is essentially the three contexts this project is compiling for. So we compile it once for .NET Framework, once for UWP, and once for .NET Standard. So what I can do here is I can actually just switch the context to .NET 4.5, and then you see what code will be compiled if I target 4.5.6. You see the .NET Standard version, which is now the one that just is lame and says I can't do anything. And then you have the, um, the UWP version as well. If we look at the project file, what's neat here is this line. If you do file new .NET standard library, what you see there is usually just target framework and then .NET standard and then some version number. But now we see .NET target frameworks, so it's a plural, and we will see me call on separated list. And what this instructs MS Build to do is to just compile this project three times or four times or whatever other things you put in there. And then what I can do is I can say I want to have one package reference across all my targets, or I can say, oh, only when I run on 4.6.1, I want to add this you know, DLL over here. What's neat is that, in that in inside of Visual Studio, you don't have to know that this project is compiled multiple times, because each of these projects does reference the GPS project, and then MS Build will make sure it picks up the right binary. So let's do one thing here. Let's me, let me add a project that targets .NET Core and see what happens if I add a reference to this guy. Let me delete the main here. Should have done F-sharp, then we wouldn't have to fight curly braces. <clears throat> so we have run this app now. What will happen? Who paid attention? Can you name me what happens when I run this app? Any guesses? OK, only one person. Boom, platform not supported. Because I only had two if devs, one for full framework, one for UWP, and the net standard one, which applies everywhere else, just throws. Now you might say, oh, this is lame. But this is actually fairly useful. Because if you think about it, what you can do now is you have a single library. And I can make this actually slightly more useful. So what I can do here is instead of just blowing up, I can add what's known to be capability API. So I added this is supported API, which will now tell me up front whether this thing will explode later on or not. So it will tell you for Net Framework or UWP, it will just work. And in the other case, it will just blow up. So what I can now do here is I can just write some conditional code. I can say if GPS is supported, do this, otherwise don't. So imagine you write a Twitter client, and all you want to do is map the coordinates so you can actually do some city lookup. But the API isn't available to you, really nothing bad happens. I mean, you just cannot tag your tweets with the location. So what this allows you to do is it allows you to wrap operating system or platform-specific functionality, provide a wrapper around it, centralize that, and then allow all your apps to basically light up on the functionality being there or not there. And it's even cooler with the newest version of Visual Studio because what you can now do as well is you can just say, generate new get package on build. So if I rebuild this guy, and I go to the output folder, we find a single NuGet package with the three DLLs in it that we just produced based on the conditional compilation. So in other words, what you get is you have a very easy way to actually centralize this thing, ship it as a single NuGet package, and nobody has to know that you had to write if devs. You can centralize this across all platforms. So basically, you're not screwed. That's the short answer. <laughs> so if you can only remember one URL, that's the URL you want to remember, because that points to our FAQs, uh, where we answer all the questions I ever got. You can also reach me on Twitter if you have any questions, or you can shoot me an email. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions, and either I can do it myself or I find somebody that can do it. Thank you very much. <laughs>